Hi everyone, I'm Zvika Berkersky, and together with Nir Bitansky, we help to put together the program of the uh, winter school that you're about to attend. Uh, and we'd like to start with uh, a broad scientific introduction to um, cryptography and quantum computing in the context of the school. So let's start by talking about quantum computing and computer science in general. One way to think about quantum computing is an attempt to construct a device that uses the physical principles of quantum mechanics in order to achieve new computational capabilities. And uh, indeed, we expect quantum computers that are based on the principles of quantum mechanics uh, to have a number of potential applications. For example, um, even most basically, just to simulate quantum physical systems rather than being uh, rather than having to perform uh, an experiment in extreme conditions, for example, if we know the laws of physics and we can simulate them on a computational device, then we can just run a simulation rather than conducting an actual experiment. Uh, another application is to be able to generate true randomness uh, as opposed to stochastic randomness, which is uh, used in classical computation. Um, and this can be beneficial both to, when generating randomness locally and also when generating randomness jointly over a communication channel. Uh, and this is uh, of use for cryptographic purposes. Uh, another aspect is uh, to generate, uh, to um, design improved algorithms for certain computational problems. And perhaps the most, the most uh, um, famous example is Shor's factoring algorithm, which allows to solve in, polynomial, in quantum polynomial time a problem that with, which classically we do not know how to solve um, even we do not know how to solve polynomially. Um, and the same holds for the discrete logarithm problem. Uh, even for lattice problems that in general are considered to be resilient to quantum algorithms, there are some cases where quantum algorithms outperform the state-of-the-art classical algorithms. Um, another example is for machine learning, uh, where um, uh, it's suggested that uh, uh, quantum algorithms can outperform classical. And um, this list is, of course, far from being exhaustive. Uh, there are many potential applications for quantum computers once they're constructed. However, uh, currently we're fairly far from constructing a complete fault tolerant so-called quantum computer. Um, the current technology allows to construct computers that have a few dozen, a few dozen qubits, the basic unit of, of computation and information in, in quantum computing. Um, and these qubits are also noisy and have a specialized architecture. So you cannot run arbitrary quantum computation on these devices, um, where this is sometimes called uh, the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing era. And um, there's also an effort to try to utilize this type of quantum devices uh, for computational purposes. So this is one viewpoint, trying to use quantum mechanics in order to build a better computer. However, you can also take a more philosophical viewpoint and say that we can think about uh, physical processes or process in general as computation. So any process that starts from some initial states and ends in some final state, you can think about it as a computation that takes some input and produces some output. And therefore, if we have a computational model that we think uh, um, sort of matches uh, the, the laws of physics, then we can get insights out of it about physical phenomena. And this has uh, a number of implications. And of course, this is not disjoint from the previous perspective of trying to utilize a quantum computer. These two things are, of course, related. Um, so one thing that you can think about is in the context of the Church-Turing hypothesis, which claims that any physical process can be simulated uh, up to uh, constant precision by a Turing machine. And there is an extended version of this hypothesis that says that this simulation is also efficient. Now, as far as we know, if quantum computing or quantum physics is, is, a viable, is viable as a computational process, then it refutes this extended Church-Turing hypothesis because um, we cannot simulate quantum um, quantum phenomena uh, efficiently using a classical using a classical machine. Another aspect of actually quantum information theory is characterizing the possible correlations between systems that are uh, separated and cannot communicate. Uh, and we know that uh, um, quantum information allows uh, a broader class of correlations between such systems compared to classical systems. Other um, areas where quantum computing actually gives insight uh, is with regards to the black hole information paradox, and this actually uses quantum cryptography um, and also some aspects of, of quantum gravity, again, uh, using, using cryptographic tools. Uh, I will not get into that. I, well, I guess I know very little about it. So this is at a very, very high level uh, regarding quantum computing and computer science in general. Now let's talk about cryptography. 
Oh, and I'm swallowed by a black hole. Now let's talk about cryptography. Um, so if indeed uh, quantum computing is possible, if, if it's possible to construct uh, a scalable quantum computer, what would be the implications on cryptography? So as I mentioned before, some of the um, cryptographic assumptions that we use, such as factoring and discrete log, uh, get broken. So we actually construct some cryptographic systems currently, uh, which are based on the hardness of factoring large numbers or um, uh, solving the discrete log problem. And uh, once, if you have a, a scalable uh, fault tolerant quantum computer, then uh, these, these assumptions no longer hold true. I mean, there is, a there is going to be um, uh, a viable polynomial time algorithm that solves these problems. And this actually, I think, gets a lot of, a lot of, a lot of attention and a lot of hype. Uh, and this is usually what people think about when they're thinking about the connection between, uh, one of the main things that people think about when they think about the connection between uh, quantum computing and, and cryptography, the sort of cryptanalysis aspect. But actually, um, you can think about it in a more fun fundamental way. It's not just the assumptions, but actually we need to reconsider our entire adversarial models because a lot of the adversarial models that we use uh, actually um, sort of rely on um, properties of, of classical computing. For example, um, we can think of adversities that have auxiliary input, um, but things can uh, qualitatively change where this, when this auxiliary input is allowed to be a quantum state. Or another example we can think about, uh, given an algorithm Oracle access to some function, uh, but given quantum Oracle access could significantly uh, change the abilities of, of such an adversary. So not only do we need to think of the underlying assumption, but also the power of the adversary changes when we think about quantum computing as something that is actually possible. Um, in the same context, we can also um, we also need to think our reductions, right? I mean, usually what we uh, what we show uh, in in cryptography and I guess in, in computer science in general is uh, the following. So we prove the hardness of primitive we prove the security of primitive B based on the security of primitive A by showing that if you have an adversary that breaks the security of primitive B, then you can use it to construct an adversary that also breaks the security of primitive A. Now. If um, um, now if this if this algorithm that we have for against primitive B is quantum, then it's not clear that it can be used in the same way as classical algorithms. So even some of our reductions um, could implicitly assume a classical model of computation, and therefore they need to be rethought um, in the context of, of quantum computing. Um, and this holds, also holds for some of the techniques that we use in order to uh, construct these primitives or show these reductions. Um, so just some of the techniques that we use seem to be uh, inapplicable in the quantum setting. And there's an interesting question of whether we just need to sort of think about the right generalization that restores these, the properties of the technique that we, that we want, or whether there's some inherent difference uh, that, that um, sort of necessitates a different approach or even impossibility in the quantum regime. So all of these uh, points that I mentioned so far actually apply even for classical cryptographic primitives. Um, so long as we consider security against a quantum adversary. And this notion is sometimes referred to as post-quantum cryptography. So it's classical cryptography, which is resilient even against adversaries that have quantum powers. So we need to really think about quantum computing, even if we don't, in, if we never intend to use quantum computing ourselves, but can think of a setting where our adversary um, might, have, might have quantum powers. And let me try to illustrate these, um, uh, these aspects using an example. So our example is the basic uh, cryptographic primitive uh, known as bit commitment. And I bet most, if not all of you have seen this before, but I'll go over it very briefly. So we have a sender and a receiver, um, and the receiver wants to make sure that the sender decides on a bit, on a value either zero or one, and does not change his mind after, uh, after it decided on this value. And this is, uh, the syntax is as follows. So the sender is going to decide on a bit. And based on the value of this bit, it's going to generate a commitment value, a commitment string. And this is, of course, a simplified example. It sends the commitment to the receiver. And once this, uh, uh, once this uh, commitment uh, string has been, um, has been uh, recorded by the receiver, the sender is supposed to not be able to change his, his mind. After, um, you know, after the fact, after the sender wants to tell the receiver uh, what, uh, what that uh, hidden bit was, it can send the value of the bit together with an opening. 
and the receiver can validate this opening, can check that this opening is indeed valid. And if the uh, opening was indeed validated, then uh, the receiver should be convinced that indeed this bit was decided on by the sender ahead of time and was not changed between the time the commitment was sent and the time that the opening was sent. How do you formalize this, uh, uh, this notion that uh, the, the sender cannot change his mind? Well, um, you can think about the following experiment. So the sender first sends some commitment that's supposed to be a commitment to some bit. And then the receiver can decide whether to ask for an opening of zero or an opening of one. If the sender is not supposed to uh, be able to change his mind, then he should only be able to open to one of these values, to either zero or one. So at least in one of these cases, um, the, the sender is supposed to fail in uh, sending an opening that will, be, that will be validated by the receiver. So this is uh, the sort of security experiment that we have in mind um, for, for, for the bit commitment. Uh, and another way to think about it is to say that the sender can send an opening to zero or an opening to one, but it cannot send an opening to zero and an opening to one at the same time. Um, and this means that it only has one value to which it can open. Um, now, actually, what I did now is actually use two different uh, definitions and sort of implicitly assume that they're uh, equivalent, but let's take a closer look and see that there is some uh, subtlety here. So the first thing that I said was that the receiver can send either zero or one, and at least for one of these challenges, the sender should not be able to produce uh, a valid opening. The second thing that I said is that the sender can produce either an opening for zero or an opening for one, but it cannot produce an opening for both zero and one at the same time. And in a classical regime, this is these two things are uh, very easily equivalent because we can just uh, in, in the security proof, uh, if we have uh, if we have a sender that can answer uh, both a zero challenge and a one challenge, what we can do is record the status of the sender at this point before receiving the challenge run it on challenge zero and receive opening for zero, and then go back to this point and run it on challenge one and then receive an opening for one. And therefore we can actually um, get, out, get from the sender both the openings for zero and for one. However, if we're thinking about a quantum sender, then uh, this is no longer the case because uh, we, can know, uh, we, we cannot necessarily record uh, a, quantum, uh, a quantum state for the sender. Or if you want to think it, about it in a different way, um, performing um, a quantum measurement, I'm not defining what it is, but I imagine that you have some intuitive uh, idea of it. Performing a quantum measurement actually destroys a quantum state. So it is possible that after I ran this, uh, after I was running this experiment with challenge zero, I can no longer go back and run it again with challenge one because the status, of the state of the sender uh, is, is, is destroyed. And this is actually an example for, I think all of these points. So first of all, it shows that um, you, you need to, well, well, you need to care about the assumption, but this is not the only thing that you need to care about. So we could uh, think that we have a security reduction that ends up uh, with an algorithm for factoring. And this would of course be useless in a quantum world because an algorithm for factoring is useless. But just replacing the, um, uh, the factoring assumption by let's say a lattice assumption that is post-quantum secure still doesn't, uh, um, still doesn't take care of the problem in the modeling. Uh, in, in needing to be able to come up with an adversarial model that actually captures the properties that we want from this primitive. So uh, here I show that we have two adversarial models that are equivalent in the classical setting, but are not equivalent in the quantum setting. And it is actually important to use the correct one uh, for, for the application that we need. And again, we also have an example for reduction because I showed you a classical reduction between these two, um, between these two uh, um, definitions or notions, which no longer holds in the quantum setting. And this also uh, is, is a good example for the setting of technique. techniques, because one of the techniques that was used in this reduction is a technique called rewinding, which says that I can uh, sort of take, a, take an algorithm once I get to some point, record the output, and then go back to a previous point in time. And this is again something that is inapplicable in general in the quantum setting. So you might want to think about alternatives um, for, for this technique if they exist. So this is an example that shows that there are various considerations beyond just sort of replacing our assumptions uh, with, with post-quantum secure assumptions that uh, need to be uh, taken into consideration 
when you consider cryptography in the quantum setting. And this is true even if the cryptographic primitive that you're talking about is classical and not quantum by itself. Let, let's keep going uh, and talk about other aspects uh, where, where quantum computing can influence cryptography. So we can think about new cryptographic objects that exist in a quantum setting and um, either have or do not have a counterpart in the classical world. So the first thing that we can think about is an extension of our classical primitives into the quantum world. So we know how to encrypt messages. Now how about encrypting quantum messages? We know how to sign messages. Well, can we sign quantum messages? Secure multi-party computation, obfuscation, you name it. You can uh, try to think about quantum extensions. And the first question is to even try to model these correctly, understand what the right definition is, and then try to see whether it's even feasible or not. And if it is, how to construct it. So this is sort of one area of, of research. Um, another area of research, which again did not exist in the classical setting, is uh, trying to take advantage of classical versus quantum interactions. So this is motivated by an idea that we have a classical adversary uh, that, uh, sorry, classical party uh, that talks to um, a, quantum, a quantum machine. And it doesn't know whether the quantum machine is actually honest or not. And it wants to use its classical powers in order to somehow strap the, um, uh, the or harness the powers of the quantum, uh, the quantum machine in a sort of, um, in, in a way that is sort of predictable and verifiable. And you can think about the problem, for example, of delegation, where you want to make sure that the quantum party actually performs the computation that it was supposed to perform. Um, another aspect uh, that you can consider is just the basic notion of pseudorandomness, but for quantum objects. So once we are talking about quantum states, then we can try to think about um, what is a random quantum state and whether there's a notion of pseudorandomness that is useful and makes sense in the setting. So again, these are just a few examples, but there's a whole sort of regime, a whole new regime of cryptographic objects that um, sort of could exist in the quantum uh, in the quantum setting, and we need to sort of understand whether they exist, what is the correct definition, how to construct them. Um, another uh, class of uh, uh, of applications or implications. Um, are to try to construct new cryptographic capabilities from quantum information, not to achieve something that is parallel to what we know classically, but rather things that are classically impossible and could potentially be quantumly possible. And this is, for example, the case for uh, information theoretically secure quantum key distribution, or you can also consider settings where uh, the cryptographic assumption that is required uh, to implement a primitive in a quantum world uh, could be weaker uh, using quantum communication could be weaker than what is required in the classical setting. The last thing uh, that again I'm I'll only mention very briefly is again using quantum cryptography as a perspective on physical phenomena as I mentioned um, in, the, in my previous slide. So uh, these are sort of a few central aspects that, that you want to consider um, when, when thinking about cryptography in, in, a, in a quantum world. Um, and now let's see what we're going to talk about in the school. Obviously, uh, we cannot cover this entire regime. So the focus uh, of the school is foundations. We're going to tackle the basic challenges and techniques for cryptography in the quantum world um, with respect to the list that I showed before. So in particular, this means that we're not going to talk about how to construct quantum computer, and we're not going to think about aspects such as standardization of post-quantum cryptography, even though these are sort of very important, uh, but in this school, we're focusing more on the fun foundational issues. So going back to the uh, list from before, um, we are not going to talk about assumptions. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, sort of uh, how to break cryptographic assumptions or how to restore cryptographic assumptions uh, that are uh, quantumly resilient. Um, uh, however, we are going to talk about uh, we are going to talk about modeling and reductions and techniques. So these are things that are sort of apply that sort of apply at a um, I know what it's called higher lower level than the actual assumption that is being used a more abstract level perhaps. Um, we are going to talk about uh, new cryptographic objects, not about all of them, but hopefully we're going to see some of them. Um, Pseudorandom quantum objects uh, we're not going to cover, um, but hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, sort of quantum analogs for cryptographic primitives and also about classical quantum interaction. Um, we're going to see a lot about uh, quantum key distribution. 
Um, and uh, crypt quantum crypto for physical phenomena, um, unfortunately, will also not be covered. So this is sort of very broadly the high level topics that we want to cover. And in what's coming up, uh, Nir is going to um, tell us a little more in detail about the specific courses uh, that uh, specific lectures uh, that we're going to uh, see throughout the school. Hi, um, I'm Nir. And uh, following up on Svika, I'd like to give you uh, a teaser for each of the topics that uh, will be covered uh, in the school and uh, also tell you about uh, our great line uh, of speakers. So the school is going to start from a crash course um, on quantum uh, computation, and this will be given by uh, Henry Yuan. Thank you, Henry. And uh, we're going to first cover the, the basics of, of quantum information. Um, what are qubits? What are quantum states? Uh, what kind of operations can you do on, uh, on quantum states, uh, the basic concepts of superposition and uh, entanglement, other fundamentals of uh, quantum information, uh, like the no-cloning theorem. Then uh, Henry will tell us about uh, um, quantum circuits and, and the model of quantum computation uh, in general. Um, it will also uh, cover some uh, famous uh, algorithms like uh, Grover and the uh, quantum Fourier transform. Um, and, and the focus is really going to be uh, on algorithms that will be somewhat relevant to what you're going to see later um, in the school. And uh, finally, he's going to tell us about some more uh, advanced topics um, like uh, complexity classes, BQP, QMA, which is the analog of, of NP in the, in the quantum world, um, mixed states, what does it mean to distinguish uh, uh, between different uh, uh, quantum states, um, etc.? Now, uh, if you're completely new to, to quantum, you should bear in mind that it takes some time to get used to it. Um, and, and you know, beyond uh, Henry's uh, crash course, um, there's a lot of material online. Uh, which could be useful to you. In particular, we put on the web page um, links to uh, uh, very good lecture notes by Ryan O'Donnell and Ronald DeWolf. You can take a look. I believe there are also exercises there that, that you can do, and this uh, um, could be helpful. Okay, so uh, our first topic is going to be quantum uh, key distribution, uh, and this will be presented by Rotemann on Friedman. And uh, it is one of the highlights of, of quantum cryptography. Uh, let me tell you a little about it, uh, starting from recalling what is the key distribution in general. So here we have Alice and Bob, and uh, they'd like to exchange a secret key, but we'd like to do it without ever meeting. And the problem is that there is an eavesdropper on the line, um, which we call Eve. Um, and we don't want Eve to learn anything about uh, their secret key, right? So when you hear about it for the first time, sounds impossible, sounds uh, magical. Uh, but as you know, this is something that uh, uh, we can do, but it requires uh, computational assumptions. We have to assume that uh, 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 Eve is bounded and there are some intractable problems, at least one-way functions, but seemingly much more. And as a matter of fact, we know that many of the assumptions on which we tend to base um, um, key distribution are actually quantumly broken, like Diffie-Hellman or RSA. So what's going on in, in the quantum setting? So in the quantum setting, everyone is quantum. Okay, Alice and Bob are quantum, and they can communicate through a quantum channel, and Eve is also quantum. Now, um, quite remarkably, it turns out that in the quantum setting, you can do this without any assumptions. So Eve could be completely unbounded, except by the laws of physics, namely quantum mechanics. And this is a very uh, uh, famous uh, result by uh, Bennett and Brassel, um from back in the, the 80s, which sort of marked the, the dawn of uh, quantum uh, cryptography. And you know how is this uh, um, possible? We know that that classically 
uh, we need computational assumptions. So there's a quantum phenomena that, that enables it, which is what we call the, the observer effect, which means that in quantum, merely looking at something can change it. Whenever you learn something about a quantum system, it may actually change it, and this change can be detected. And this is exactly what allows for um, such key distribution. Now, another uh, um, thing that, that I find uh, quite remarkable is that this is, this is already doable. Okay, so there's you know, a lot of discussion about whether quantum computing uh, will become uh, feasible or not and, and, and when, uh, but key distribution is something that you can already do. The, the technology is already out there. You can go out and, and, and find uh, uh, companies that, that do it. So um, Rotem will tell us about uh, quantum key distribution and uh, she's going to tell us how to uh, define it, um, how to construct it, of course, um, proving security, and of course, developing the, um, the, the appropriate tools in order to do that. Uh, privacy amplification, which is something that you know from the classical setting, uh, but in the quantum setting, it's quite different. In particular, you have to worry about quantum uh, side information about your uh, uh, secret key. And uh, finally, and I do hope that uh, uh, Rotem gets there, um, she'll discuss uh, uh, device-independent uh, cryptography. Um, and, and, and this is uh, the question of whether we can still do quantum key distribution when we don't necessarily trust that our device is doing what it's supposed to do. So I told you that there are companies out there that will would sell you devices that, that would let you do quantum key distribution, uh, but you know you get a box and you're not sure what actually is going on there. And it turns out that, that you can test that, that it's doing the, the thing that it's supposed to do. And um, I hope uh, we'll get to discuss it. Our next topic is post-quantum security beyond assumptions. And this will be presented by Mark Zandri. Um, and I assume you've all heard about uh, post-quantum uh, cryptography, where the basic goal is to obtain uh, the same crypto, good old crypto that we know and love, uh, but with stronger security, security against quantum um, adversaries. Right, so uh, we've accomplished quite a lot in classical uh, uh, cryptography. We have a host of primitives. We can prove their security. And now we'd like to uh, translate them uh, into this new setting where the, the adversary is, uh, is quantum. And we have to have uh, a couple of things in mind. So we have to ask ourselves whether our definitions still apply, do the same constructions apply, what about the security reductions? Um, and one thing that, that we can say for sure is that we have to change the, the underlying computational uh, assumptions because uh, some of the assumptions we, we rely on classically, like, like factoring, are quantumly um, insecure. Now, we could hope that you know, if we take uh, our assumptions and we replace them with, with post-quantum assumptions, say, like uh, uh, learning with errors, which is conjectured to be uh, uh, post-quantum, um, then everything will be OK, and uh, um, uh, the same primitives uh, will also work uh, in this setting. And in some uh, cases, for example, if you think about uh, uh, pseudo-random generators, this is essentially true. Uh, but it turns out that this is not always the case. So something we're very much used to when coming up with cryptographic security definitions is that we first uh, have to figure out how exactly the adversary is allowed to interact with our system. And when you think about quantum adversaries, then their interaction with our system could be essentially different from that of the classical adversary. And uh, let me give you one example. So thinking about a pseudorandom function, for instance, we can hope that if we take uh, a pseudorandom function that has a classical reduction to a post-quantum assumption, say on uh, lattices, 
then we'll automatically get uh, a post-quantum uh, pseudorandom function. But the answer to this question really depends on what kind of queries the quantum attacker gets to make to the function. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that the answer is no if the adversary can make superposition queries, which is something that is very natural for a quantum adversary, something very basic that you can do. Um, that is, you could design a pseudorandom function with a classical reduction to say uh, uh, the learning with errors assumptions that is conjectured to be uh, post-quantum uh, secure. And yet, if you can make words in superposition, it would completely break. Now, the good news is that we do have constructions, in particular, some of the constructions that, that we know, like the, the GGM constructions, are post-quantum secure, provided, of course, that you, know, you replace the underlying primitive, say, one-way functions, with a post-quantum one-way function. But this really requires a completely new security proof, um, a new security reduction with, uh, uh, with very different uh, techniques. Okay, so um, Mark is going to tell us about uh, all of this. And specifically, uh, it will tell us when does post-quantum security follow uh, directly without too much effort? Um, when does it break? What can we do to fix it? What kind of uh, uh, tools and techniques do we have? And uh, some topics that we will touch along the way are the superposition queries that uh, I mentioned, which come up in, in many definitions. Uh, the quantum random oracle model, which is something that we often use in the classic setting, and is essentially different in the quantum setting. In particular, basic techniques like, say, uh, lazy sampling don't really work there, at least not as is. Uh, and it will also touch uh, uh, rewinding, which is something that I'm also going to mention uh, in a bit. Our next topic is uh, zero knowledge and multi-party computation in the quantum world. Um, and this will be presented by Alex Grillo. Um, and you know that zero knowledge and MPC are central to cryptography. Uh, in fact, each one of them had their own uh, winter school in previous years. And uh, Alex will tell us about them in the quantum setting, with focus on the differences compared to the classical setting. So uh, let me start by, by reminding you what a zero-knowledge protocol is. Um, so in zero-knowledge, we have a prover and the verifier. And the prover would like to uh, prove to the verifier some NP statement. But it'd like to do it in a way so that the verifier learns nothing from the interaction, except, of course, for the fact that the statement is true. Now, uh, as you know, this is, again, one of the, the miracles of uh, modern uh, cryptography. And, and it can actually uh, be done, uh, and even uh, under uh, minimal assumptions. The question is whether the classical protocols that we have are also secure against quantum adversaries. So in terms of soundness, uh, the classical protocols um, are actually also sound against unbounded provers, and in particular, uh, quantum provers. So the question really boils down to whether we can get zero knowledge against quantum verifiers. And let me tell you what is the challenge here. So the way that we uh, typically prove that the verifier learns nothing from the proof call is by exhibiting an efficient simulator that, unlike the prover that knows the witness, knows nothing and yet manages to simulate a real looking proof. Now, the way that this is uh, uh, typically done is by means of rewinding meaning that the simulator runs the verifier again and again, each time feeding it different messages and observes um, its responses. Then at some point, it knows enough in order to uh, simulate. Now, while this works uh, perfectly well in the classical setting, in, in the quantum setting, this is actually a problem. And, and why is that? So the same observer effect 
that we use in order to achieve a, a quantum key distribution now works against us. So when the simulator observes the verifier's responses uh, to its repeated uh, um, uh, messages in, in, in uh, different executions, then it may actually disturb the verifier's internal quantum state and accordingly deem the uh, uh, simulation uh, invalid. So this is really uh, uh, a challenge, but luckily it turns out that it is still doable. And in fact, some of the classical protocols can be shown to be uh, secure against quantum verifiers, but it requires new techniques such as uh, quantum uh, rewinding. Um, and, and, and these don't always work. They do work for, for some protocols, but for example, in constant round protocols, they don't work. Now going beyond zero knowledge, we can now talk about general multi-party computation protocols where a bunch of distrustful parties would like to compute a function of their joint inputs. And much like the, the classical case, once we have zero knowledge, we can combine it with oblivious transfer in order to get MPC for general functions. Now it will be post-quantum oblivious transfer and we'll get post-quantum MPC. So this applies to classical protocols. And an interesting question is whether we can gain something using quantum communication and quantum capabilities by honest parties. And it turns out that the answer is yes, we can actually gain uh, in terms of assumptions. So if we allow quantum communication, then we can get MPC from one-way functions alone, right? And this is something that classically is, of course, inconceivable and uh, subject to formal barriers, and yet quantumly it can be done. Now, it could be that after I've told you that you can also do a key distribution unconditionally, using quantum communication, it may come as less of a surprise, but it was actually proven very recently. Okay, so Alex will tell us about all of this and uh, more. Specifically, uh, we'll talk about classical zero-knowledge protocols against quantum verifiers for all of NP. Uh, he will also mention the generalization to the quantum analog of NP known as QMA. Um, he will talk about uh, uh, MPC from one-way functions, as I just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, and finally, we'll also mention uh, MPC protocols for quantum computations rather than classical computations. Our last topic is delegation of quantum computation. And this will be presented by Thomas Vidic. And What's the point here? So even if quantum computers uh, become available in the foreseeable future, this is not something that we expect to see at every home. What is more likely to happen is that we'll be delegating our quantum computations uh, to a server, right? To a quantum uh, uh, server. And to some extent, this is already happening today. You can actually perform certain quantum computations, uh, perhaps restricted ones, but, but nevertheless, um, um, let's say on the, the IBM cloud. So what's the, the basic setting here? So we have a quantum uh, a server and we have a client that is classical or has restricted quantum capabilities more generally. And the client would like to perform a certain quantum computation over its input X. And for that, we want to design a protocol between the client and server which allows the client at the end to learn the result of the computation. Now, what do we want here? So the first thing that we want is of course, um, soundness. So the client should be able to verify that he got the correct uh, uh, result. Accordingly, we sometimes call the, the client the verifier and the server uh, prover. And another thing that uh, we might be interested in is privacy. Okay, we'd like uh, sometimes to ensure that the client preserves the privacy of its input X, uh, in which case we'll think about this input as encrypted and the server somehow has to do the computation blindly over the, uh, the encrypted uh, um, input. 
Um, and I'd like to uh, uh, note that you know these two requirements are, are sort of independently interesting. That is, even if we trust the server to perform the competition correctly, we may still be interested in achieving uh, uh, privacy. So, so there are different features that uh, we may care about when designing quantum delegation protocols. Uh, one, for example, is the capabilities of the client. Ideally, it should be completely uh, classical. At the other extreme, it would be fully quantum, which is not interesting. But you can also think about things in the middle. Uh, for example, perhaps it could only perform quantum operations on single qubits. Another uh, uh, feature that we care about is the level of security from computational to ideal information theoretic security. And we can also consider different models. So for example, we can consider the multi-server model where the client interacts with uh, several non-communicating uh, servers. <clears throat> and this is uh, analogous to the classical model of uh, uh, multi-prover interactive proofs, um, only that we need to also consider quantum phenomena like entanglement between the servers. So, of course, there could be uh, uh, different trade-offs between these uh, uh, features, and Thomas will tell us about uh, some of the points in this uh, uh, space of, uh, of features. So, specifically, he's going to tell us about uh, um, information theoretic security with a quantum client, um, or with a classical client, but two servers. Um, and he will also tell us about computational security with a classical client, a fully classical client, and a single server. And this is sort of uh, uh, the state of the art uh, in this area. It's a relatively uh, a recent um, line of work. And uh, along the way, he's going to introduce some uh, uh, relevant uh, topics. Some are interesting on their own. For example, the quantum one-time pad, uh, uh, quantum authentication, quantum morphic encryption, self-testing, and, uh, and more. Okay, so uh, that's it. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Kermit Hazai and uh, Benny Pinkas for organizing um, and for inviting uh, me and Svika to help with the scientific program. Um, and also to Unit uh, Holmberger, um, thanks to whom everything here runs uh, smoothly. So uh, thank you. And uh, enjoy uh, the rest of the school.